It's kind of interesting that if people perceive your country to be poor, they don't want to pay a lot for your food. <laughs> Why does pasta seem so much more expensive than dishes such as pho, ramen, hand-pulled noodles, and pad ciu? Hopefully we get an answer by the end of this video. And if you're excited to hear it, please hit that like button right now and let's delve into this discussion. David. Oh man, a tweet just went viral from a writer in Australia. It said, just pay $32 for a bowl of pho, crime. Yes, it wouldn't feel as criminal if it was pasta, which is indeed a bit racist. Maybe uh, I'm a little bit racist. Uh, oh, well, she so was she's, Chinese, yeah. Well, she's kind of, uh, it's a tongue-in-cheek joke and she's trying to be self-aware here though. But it kind of sparked this big online debate debate that kind of always happens but now people are talking about it yeah there have been a ton of threads over the years wondering why andrew italian food which is by all means pretty much just noodles and cream sauce by the way delicious by the way i'm not dissing it can you can charge like 20 30 40 dollars for that in the west but asian food finally broke out of like the 10 15 dollar zone despite possibly having just as much if not more work put into it oh well i think there's a lot of reasons by the way guys i want to say italian food is the best European cuisine by far. So we're not trying to say Italian food is, is not good, by the way. We're just saying it's possible it's a little overpriced, but let's talk about why. All right, so we got reasons why Italian food is so expensive in America, and then we'll even uh, have some little fun, creative suggestions on what maybe Asian restaurants could do to, uh, you know, up the pricing of the experience a little bit. So let's get into number one, Andrew. Why is Italian food, relative to even other parts of the world, so expensive in America. I would say it's fair to say, by the way, Italian food delicious, even Italian American Sicilian food, I still love it. It is a little overpriced. Okay, yeah, but a lot of people do say that even in Europe, Italian food is actually not that expensive, but in America, it's actually overpriced even more than it is over there, right? Yeah, I think that the recipes are slightly different over there as well, too. You know, less cream, less right. fat, less proteins. Um, all right, first of all, to go through them real quick, I mean, I think that Italian restaurants, first of all, they focus a little bit more on hospitality. You're not just paying for the bolognese or the cacio e pepe, right? You're paying for the guy to come over, grate it with the parmesan. He has a suit on. He's talking to you. You know, he's going to take his time. They got a wine menu, all this other stuff. Right, right. White you're, tablecloth. You're, you're paying for like a date spot, like not just the pasta, okay? And <laughs> the you're, date spot. You're paying for the romance and the breadsticks. You don't think about it. They give you bread in the beginning of the meal with olive oil and balsamic vinegar. Right. You got to charge for that. I mean, somebody even got to pay for like the filament in the soft white yeah. light bulb, right? And I think, you know, probably realistically all the way throughout their supply chain from the suppliers to the grocery stores to the farmers that are farming some of those ingredients, they're probably getting paid more than like the Asian supply chains as well, to be honest. Yeah. I mean, like your point said, Andrew, if Italian food is a little bit expensive and Asian food is a little bit underpriced, there's going to be a big price chasm created right there. Yeah, and uh, another reason I do think is that Italians can make the argument that even pasta dishes using a lot of different types of cheeses like Parmesan, uh, even mozzarella, and then milk and cream and butter, those are all ingredients that Asian restaurants do not use, essentially, for the most part. Right. And some of those ingredients can be expensive because the cheese can be expensive because if it's imported... I mean, you got to pay for that. Yeah. Obviously, guys, Western cuisines are perceived completely differently, right? Like if poor immigrants come over and they're the first ones to bring over Asian cuisine in survival mode. I'm not saying Italian food didn't start that way in America back in like 1850, but obviously it's gone through a very different arc over the past 150 years. I'll tell you this, man. I just think that some of the guys would have been better off and or some of the poor first like Chinese immigrants would have been better off if they would have learned to cook Italian food. Oh, would have been interesting. Dude, do you think uh, the Italians would have been happy about that? I think uh, there would have been some scuffles over that. Hey, okay? uh, hey, uh, you know, uh, did you see Mr. Wong over there? Looks like he's cooking uh, Aglianatis, you know. No, I know just they one ton. Leave me alone. I just put some tomato sauce on one ton. They sure do look like Aglianatis. Oh, no, those are some tortellinis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on to number two, Andrew. Uh, people at the end of the day, and I know Anthony Bourdain addressed this, David Chang addressed this in Ugly Delicious. Um, people have an unshakable image of how worthy is your culture, your cuisine, your civilization. And that has to do with restaurant pricing uh, as unfortunate, but as real as that is. Yeah, I mean, I do think Italian food and Italian restaurants, they focus on this fine dining, romantic kind of vibe. And that all plays into their culture. It all works together. Because 
Italian as a language is very romantic, right? It's right up there with French and things like that. So, of course, that's the whole view of it in the West, right? Like Chinese food, for example, as we know, it does have high and low levels. Uh, it's not really viewed in this manner. Like, no one walks into a Chinese restaurant being like, oh, mi amor, it's a lovely Chinese spot, you know, like going on for a date and stuff like that. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of the immigrants, they arrived, they were just trying to survive opening these restaurants and not even trying to think about how to thrive. And maybe, you know, some of them kind of got stuck in a groove when they could have like pursued this like natural arc of like up the value added chain, even though it never happened. I mean, I think when you're looking at the Western viewpoint on Asian food, they're going after the last 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And there's a reason why Japan oper um, has the highest end of the hierarchy, right? Like people mm. are willing to pay the most for Japanese food. Yeah. Maybe when it comes noodle to noodle, I'd say ramen is the one that almost touches Italian. Not quite there, but it's almost there. But yeah. as far as like obviously Japanese sushi omakases, I would say Korean food is pushing up market in the last yeah. like three, four, five years that I've seen. It's kind of interesting that if people perceive your country to be poor, they don't want to pay a lot for your food. <laughs> right. Like, they don't they don't want to pay they a poor person or somebody they perceive as poor or from a poor yeah. country, they don't want to fully respect their knowledge base. No, right? and no, they don't want to think that whatever this poor person eats from this poor country is something worthy of paying more for. And right. probably the vibe isn't going to be great because Italians, they still have a bunch of luxury brands that they can kind of fall back on. Ferragamo, Lamborghini, like they have these things. They're like, yeah, look, we make up the pasta and the Lamborghini. Like, look, But those are course. North Italian, yeah, by the way. No? <laughs> you have to pay for it. Yeah, the, even though we're Sicilian, come on, yeah, give us the credit. But I'm saying, you know, like, so it's a whole entire... It's kind of weird to put it's it... It's very macro. It's it's, it's a very macro. culture if, thing, If man. you're trying to analyze the apron cost with the cream cost, that's guys, a whole different guys, thing. Guys, your country... This is, this is a cultural credit. Your country got to make good cars and good clothing, Ooh. I think. I don't know. That's just a theory. I'm not saying it should. Obviously, I want to pay a lot for Vietnamese food. I want to pay a lot for Chinese food, Indian food, whatever. Yeah, and Bourdain, specifically, RIP, was a fierce defender of Mexican food, yeah. Indian food, Southeast yeah. Asian food himself. And he said, he said, this is, frankly, a racist assumption that Mexican food or Indian food should be cheap. Yeah, I will say this, and we can't blame everybody all the time. We have to take some self-agency. Even members of the own group sometimes are unwilling to pay large sums of for their own food, right? Yeah, Would you agree with yeah, that? Yeah, like yeah. Even well, in-group people, like people I, of the same tribe, Thai people eating Thai food, Chinese people eating Chinese food. Yeah. You know what I mean? They're, they're unwilling to pay like the fusion hipster rise elevated yes. prices, whether it was elevated in the right way or elevated in a whack way. Yeah, I mean, we have we know Filipino chef friends who always say that they have this problem where because Filipinos don't want to pay for food that they're tita made, you know what I'm saying? Like or your grandma, your Nona, whatever you're like, mama, like you have trouble paying a lot of money for it unless that spot is going to provide you with a completely different vibe that you can't get at home. Like a romantic vibe, for example, you know? Yeah. I mean, guys, like we said, we are just pointing things out. We're not placing the blame because, you know, there's probably a bunch of blame to go around and some of it's just out of everybody's control. Point number three, Andrew, what would make Asian food more upmarket or more expensive or be able to retain... Um, break out of that like low margin, high volume thing that obviously it's been in for probably like 30, 40, if you're talking about Chinese food, a yeah. hundred years in America. Yeah, well, I, th I think you got to look at things like uh, Korean barbecue, right? They're cooking it at your table. The server comes around. It's got to chop your meat for you and stuff like that. Uh, there's a lot of performance there. Also, uh, I would say even like, at a Heidi Lao, which is a high-end Chinese hot pot chain, you pay for this dancing noodle, this guy to put on this performance as he hand stretches the noodle for you. Obviously, the raw cost of that noodle is very, very cheap, but you're paying, you go pay the, the cost at Heidi Lao to see a guy dance for you. Yeah, you're paying for the dance performance, <laughs> yeah. but he's just for the, got a noodle in for his hand. For the hands. rave hands with the noodle in between. And I also see so many videos of like cacio e pepe, which is a very simple dish. It's like macaroni and cheese. Say like, right, cacio e pepe. It's like cacio e pepe. Not to underplay it, but it's like uh, macaroni and cheese, except like Super Saiyan and with spice. And then uh, it's really good, by the way, but it, it's overpriced. And then a guy comes around and mixes the Parmesan into it. This is something that he would have done in the kitchen, but they're just bringing the last part of the cooking to your table. And I think that more Asian restaurants could do that. Like, right. for example, at a pho restaurant, very simple, very easy, right? 
So instead of bringing the bowl of pho with the soup in it already, you bring out the bowl of pho with the soup separate, right? And the meat's on top. And then right in front of you, the person pours the scalding hot broth in front of you into the bowl and then garnishes it with a little, you know, salt bay scallion and, and cilantro right, right on top. salt bay the pho. I mean, I guess the reason why I could believe that or even like, for example, pressing the guotas right in front of you is because in places like Vietnam and in Taiwan, they're gonna, the way they serve food there is more like singular dishes at singular stalls. So you end up kind of seeing it happen in front of you because a lot of that food is like served street side or like at least stall side. Dude, one of the best examples is like a Benihana's or like the hibachi grills. That food there that you eat is not anything spectacular. It's just fresh and hot and you get a performance. But you get the shrimp in the hat. And you get the, the sake yeah. in the mouth. Yeah, you get the Asian dude to go flirt with your girlfriend and, and throw the shrimp in her face and then squeeze the sake five feet. Go, ah. He's so witty with his quips. He's so quick. You can react to everything. Yeah, he's, he is funny. He should be valued more. He, he puts on a good performance. I think as far as a general note goes, I think you got to take a look at chains that people have successfully done to previously very like ethnic enclave cuisines, right? Like obviously... You know, Italian food has gone through a pretty crazy arc since Italians arrived in America, what, in like 1850 in large numbers. They had 150, 170 years to go. Um, obviously, Asians, you could say maybe really, really large numbers in America, 50 years. So we got to like ramp up our arc, right? But like you said, there's for Korean barbecue, there's coat. For um, pho, there's a ton of chains trying to do mm -hmm. it. You know, there was you even saw one doing it for Bun Kun, Android 626. There's one chain called Pho and More that's try, sort of almost giving it like a, a King Taco vibe. King Taco was the first Mexican chain in LA to sort of systemize LA street tacos. Right, right, right. And I think uh, one last thing that I want to say, and this is like not really an easy thing, but it's tough because people will always pay more at restaurants where they drink alcohol, where they have a wine list, where the food makes you want to eat wine. And oftentimes it is a lot of protein. It's a lot of steak, right? It's heavy stuff. You want the wine to cut through maybe whatever. Yes, I know white wine generally goes with seafood, red wine with meats, whatever. But I'm just saying like, I guess if your food can't in, induce that type of feeling in people, then yes, it's true. They don't want to pay as much because maybe it's not as fancy or romantic or date-like of a spot. So I think that's one thing that I'm seeing a lot of the nice new Asian restaurants that are opening, they're able to give you that vibe yeah. and make you want to buy more drinks and bring a date Yeah, because they're trying to appeal to more of the Western mainstream consumer demographic as well as Asian Americans who have a little bit of money who are willing to spend in that similar fashion. Because obviously the old school people, you would bet, and unlikely. Yeah. Uh, anyways, guys, let us know in the comments down below what you think. What can Asian spots do to uh, charge more if that's a thing that they should do? And then also, why do you think like certain cuisines are more expensive than others? You know, but uh, yeah, I mean, just let us know in the comments down below. Hopefully you found that discussion helpful. Uh, it was actually fun to delve into it and look into it. because Yeah, man, I was I researching know. all types of fresh pasta costs versus dry pasta costs and all this type of stuff I hadn't really never thought about. So let us know in the comment section below, guys. What did you think of our prompt? And until next time, we the Hot Pot Boys. We out. Peace. Peace.